Hello, welcome back. Uh, we are doing John chapter 20. Uh, this is our 22nd week or something like that of our uh, walk through John. Uh, so just to share, this is a um, Bible study group uh, that we've been doing, uh, going one chapter at a time through John. Uh, we are getting pretty close to the end uh, with chapter 20 this week. Uh, certainly uh, an exciting chapter. Uh, this is the resurrection. Uh, so uh, a really good one. We've been quoting, uh, if you've been following along with the others, the purpose of this book, um, the two verses we've got down here below, uh, these are written that you can believe Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, uh, by believing you have life in his name. We've been quoting it every week uh, for uh, 22 weeks or something now, uh, and we're finally in the chapter uh, where these things are said, uh, which is fun. Uh, this chapter could have many names, it could just be called Jesus Resurrection, Stone Rolled Away, things like that. Um, I kind of see as the theme of this chapter kind of the see uh, and believe, right? And see, and there's this thing about touch, right? So there's two stories in here. Uh, you could break it up into like two halves, kind of a story about Mary or a story about Thomas. You could also break each of those halves into two halves, uh, where the first half of Mary is just at the tomb, the second is Jesus and Mary, and then uh, there's two appearances to the uh, disciples, one without Thomas, one with Thomas. So we're going to get into all of that. Uh, it's going to be really awesome. Um, you're going you're gonna to love it. Uh, purpose statements. Uh, so we've had uh, the purpose statement of the whole Gospel of John. I was on that last slide, uh, and this is in this chapter. Uh, we've seen that there are sometimes kind of like purpose statements almost inside the chapter. So like last chapter, for example, uh, I kind of saw verse 35 as like a purpose statement of the chapter. So uh, the man is given testimony. His testimony is true. Uh, he knows he's telling the truth, um, and he testifies so that you can believe. And so the man is almost certainly John himself, uh, who's saying, hey, I saw this. Um, you would assume uh, that chapter 20, the purpose of chapter 20, is the same as uh, the purpose of the whole book, uh, but it's actually kind of not, which is weird. Uh, chapter 20, uh, the, the purpose statement is actually, uh, it comes down to something Jesus tells Thomas at the very end. Uh, because you have seen me, you have believed. Uh, blessed are those who have not seen uh, and yet have believed, right? And so the seeing and believing uh, is just a huge part uh, of this chapter. Uh, where does it fall? Big picture. Always good to know your address uh, in John. So we are in the sixth section. Uh, so we've had like the, the um, prologue, uh, the sections, chapters one through four, uh, five through ten, the Lazarus section, uh, Jesus' final words, really good stuff in there. Um, and then here it's mainly the physical of his arrest, uh, his trial, uh, his crucifixion, his burial, uh, and now we are to the uh, the third chapter in the chunk, uh, the resurrection. So the uh, the exciting third uh, chapter in this chunk. Uh, you can see that as the uh, the wheel goes, uh, it's a slightly shorter chapter, uh, 608 uh, Greek words used. Um, and the final one in this uh, slightly shorter chunk, right? So some of the chapters in like 5 through 10 were much bigger, right? But this is a, a pretty uh, manageable chunk. All very physical, uh, so very easy to visualize what's happening in this. Uh, if you know other things about the Bible, you know other things about Jesus' resurrection and the stories uh, that were told, uh, you might guess that it could be anything in this list. Uh, I've kind of highlighted what it really is. Uh, some of the things that we see, um, if we kind of merge together all these sources, uh, there's going to be stories about the stone uh, being rolled away, uh, Mary uh, meeting Jesus, uh, Jesus appearing to Peter. This is actually kind of a mysterious story. Uh, it's mentioned in... Um, and Luke 24 mentions it, but doesn't say what it happened. Uh, then Paul mentions it in uh, 1 uh, Corinthians uh, chapter 15, uh, but it's like not told. Uh, wait till wait till we get to 21 for that one. Um, there's a really good story in Luke about the road to Emmaus. We won't hear that at all in John, which is too bad because it's really good. Uh, Jesus with uh, the 12. Uh, it was actually probably more than 12, but uh, in John it kind of appears to be the 12. Uh, well, 12 minus Judas, so the 11. Uh, then if you read all the accounts, it's uh, pretty clear Jesus goes to Galilee, right? So uh, Jesus appears for 40 days, uh, and it kind of seems like at the end of uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, you know, they would have gone home. Uh, so most of Jesus' 40 days with them 
was actually in Galilee, right? Like on the on the order of like 33 out of the 40 days were all in Galilee, uh, maybe 30 because he comes back to Jerusalem later. Um, references to many visits, references to coming back to Jerusalem for the ascension at the Mount of Olives. Um, and so the question is, what what does John choose to tell us? Uh, and we're going to see more detailed information about a fewer number of things. And that's that's John's MO, right? So he gives us more details, richer content about fewer stories. Uh, and that's uh, just delightful uh, to see the level of details. Uh, other things, uh, just to kind of give you a big picture on other sources outside of the Gospels that we have about the resurrection stories. Uh, this one is from Acts uh, chapter 1. So Acts of the Apostles. Um, it says just like he gave many convincing proofs uh, that that itself is not convincing proof. So he's just kind of saying that it happened. Uh, it was over a period of 40 days. Uh, and then this one that's an Acts, it's all about preparing for what's next. So it's all about preparing uh, for the Holy Spirit coming at Pentecost. Uh, so I just highlighted a few things uh, from that. By the way, I also highlighted in red um, there was still this mindset of the Messiah bringing like military political uh, justice, right? Uh, so are you going to restore it to Israel or are we going to still be under the Romans? Like he's still getting it 40 days after his resurrection. So it, it's a confusing uh, thing to understand who Jesus is uh, and what he's bringing. So it's just kind of funny I highlighted that. Uh, other um, kind of like resurrection information uh, that, that talks specifically about it. There's there's more than what I mentioned here, right? So like, for example, the next story in Acts is about um, they're going to pick a 12th apostle uh, to replace Judas. Uh, and their criteria is they want somebody who's been a witness to not just his teaching, but also his resurrection, right? And so there's a lot of information about the resurrection. I, honestly, I think the best information is just how changed this group of people was, how fired up uh, for their whole lives uh, after this event they were, because they kind of go from a slightly disorganized like bunch of people to like man, men on a mission, right? Men and women uh, on a mission. So it's kind of interesting. Uh, at any rate, this is uh, from 1 Corinthians. This is from Paul. Um, Date-wise, this would have come before any of the Gospels. So we, we think Mark was probably first, uh, which was probably not to like 62. Hard to say for sure. Um, this is from um, an early letter of Paul. So this is like in the 50s, right? So many years before uh, any of the Gospels are written. Um, and already Paul says that, you know, what I received, meaning this is already like well communicated, of Christ died, buried, raised on the third day. Um, and Paul mentions some of the people uh, that he appeared to. Uh, he starts with um, <laughs> Cephas. This is confusing. So uh, that means Simon Peter. Um, I'm sure most people know that. But just to kind of tell the story. So uh, Jesus gave um, Simon a nickname. So his name was Simon. Uh, he called him Kepha. Uh, Kepha is a Hebrew Aramaic word, which means rock. So he called him the rock, Kepha. Um, and then Kepha, uh, which means rock, uh, got translated, not transliterated, but translated into Greek, uh, Petrus. Um, and then Petrus got transliterated into uh, Latin and then English. Uh, so we call him Simon Peter. Uh, but his real name would have been Kepha. Um, and so Paul here just translates Kepha straight into Greek and calls him Kephas. And then we, of course, pronounce it Cephas, right? Because we pronounce C as an S. No big deal. He starts with, uh, starts with Peter, does not mention Mary Magdalene, uh, which is kind of surprising. All four gospel accounts will directly name Mary Magdalene as the first one that Jesus appeared to. So uh, I want to definitely make sure to give her credit uh, as, uh, as the one Jesus picked to be first, right? Uh, the 12, he says the 12 instead of the 11, they did replace Judas with uh, Mattathias. And so they were still kind of known as the 12, uh, but they would have been 11 at the time. Uh, he appeared to more than 500 uh, brothers and sisters at the same time. Most are still living. So like when Paul wrote this in the 50s, like he's like, go, just go talk to him, right? Like this is not this is not a secret. This is not something spoken in a corner. Um, <laughs> some, some of these 500 have died, but just go talk to him, right? There's really not, um, not a hard thing to do uh, in their time period. That would have been a nice time period to be in, right? Um, he also appeared to James. This would have been James, the brother of Jesus. Interestingly, this is about the only mention we have of this. 
we don't get any details. Uh, we we see James changed, all right. So we see James, his brother, in the Gospels, who didn't believe in him, and then we um, see James's uh, letter, uh, so the the Epistle James, the general epistle, um, and we also see from the you know like the. <clears throat> Was it the father's evidence? I've got the right term there. Uh, that James was the pastor of the Jerusalem church for 20 years, right? So clearly something changed in James. Uh, and I think Paul nails it right here as the appearance of his brother to James. Um, all the apostles, so not just the 12, but everyone who was sent. Um, and then he himself also, he would have not been in the 40 days. It's kind of fun to uh, to go through and read, um, by the way, all the, all the gospel accounts. We did this last week uh, where we looked not just at John's version uh, of a story, but we looked at what did Matthew have to say, uh, what did uh, Luke have to say, uh, what did John say, and what did Mark say. Uh, we're not going to take the time to do that this week, uh, but I do want to kind of talk about it at some point. Um, and so I thought I would just do it now. Uh, so we're going to get we're going to get into John. John's going to be the focus. Uh, but I kind of wanted to summarize a little bit for you uh, what you see in these other uh, gospel accounts. So um, Matthew, uh, just to kind of mention a couple things on him, uh, he mentions like uh, dawn of the first day of the week, uh, Mary Magdalene, um, and the other Mary. So lots of little differences. John's going to just spotlight Mary Magdalene, uh, but Matthew mentions two women, right? Um, John talks about the stone rolling away uh, with an earthquake. Uh, no, no other gospel authors mention that. Uh, John, or sorry, Matthew also mentioned an earthquake at the crucifixion. Uh, no other gospel authors mention that. So um, it's funny that John's story is going to be about doubting Thomas, right? Who he called doubting Thomas. Um, but whenever you read these accounts, do keep in mind that it's a summary of what that author considered important um, of you know, essentially a 40 day period. And so the things that are important to Matthew might be different uh, than the things that are important to Luke or the things that are important to John. Um, and try to take it as a positive and not as a negative. They don't conflict. I mean, whether you mention um, just Mary or you mention two Marys, that's, that's not really a conflict. Uh, whether you mention one angel or two angels, not really a conflict. Uh, but it is interesting to see uh, things. Matthew talks a lot about the guards. Um, he uh, talks about the, the angel talking to the Marys. Um, and then, uh, I think this is funny, he mentions them clasping the feet of Jesus. Um, we're going to see in John uh, that Mary Magdalene uh, grabs a hold of Jesus uh, to where he has to say, uh, you know, hey, Mary, you, you got to let go. Uh, but this one, clasps the feet. I enjoy that. Uh, it's also interesting, we'd have to go through and read uh, every word, how short it is, right? So it's, it's very short. So there's this whole section about the guards, um, which I'm not really as interested in, uh, but you should go read it sometime. And then, boom, they're in Galilee, right? So in Matthew's version, uh, the, the message is go to Galilee, uh, and then they go to Galilee. <laughs> um, and then the only thing in Matthew's version is the Great Commission. Uh, which is which is cra crazy, right? Um, and the Great Commission is uh, awesome, right? Like we should definitely uh, we should definitely read the Great Commission and be familiar with it. Uh, but it is kind of the only thing that Matthew wanted to focus on. Um, so his his whole thing is super short, um, and he says to make disciples of all nations, not not just uh, believers, but disciples, people that are following. Uh, and he mentions the Trinity, the Father, the Son. Uh, and the Holy Spirit. So uh, an excellent account, but man, if you read just his, uh, you would think that like at 7 a.m., the two women went to the tomb. Uh, by 8.30 a.m., uh, the apostles are, are, out of Gal are out of Jerusalem, back to Galilee, uh, and never come back, right? It's kind of what you might think whenever you read uh, just Matthew's account. So very good uh, that we have more than just Matthew's account, but Matthew adds uh, quite a bit, um, including a very well-phrased Great Commission. Uh, so that was kind of uh, Matthew's, um, so some interesting things in there. Uh, the next one we'll look at is uh, Luke. I put them in this order because you can see it's chapter 28 and then chapter 24, uh, and there's going to be a cool little pattern, right, for people like numbers. Uh, Luke gives more details. Uh, Luke is uh, uses more words, which is nice. Uh, if I were to skip to the slide on the words, uh, he's got two, three times uh, the number of words uh, as Matthew, which I really appreciate. He's going to tell different stories. Uh, we won't uh, necessarily go through it all. 
He mentions the stone already being rolled away. Uh, he mentions different Marys. Um, <laughs> Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, uh, also Joanna, and others, right? So we can see that this list is like um, spotlighting certain people. Uh, but there were numerous women uh, that went uh, on this, so I'll just go ahead and highlight that, just kind of mention that. Uh, he mentions Peter uh, running to the tomb, so we're going to see that in John as well. Um, and then he's got this excellent, just excellent story about two people on the road to Emmaus. This is mentioned in Mark, uh, but here's where the story is. Um, and it's really interesting because you see like how Jesus starts to explain the Old Testament to people, right? Um, so he talks about Moses uh, and the prophets. <coughs> and then later he'll say Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms, right? So really just, uh, just an excellent uh, story. After the road to Emmaus, uh, so he is not recognized by them until he breaks the bread, uh, and then they realize uh, that it was Jesus. Uh, the next story that, that Luke tells is uh, they're in a locked room, which we're going to hear that in John as well, uh, and comes in and says, peace be with you. So great, uh, great line, shalom, uh, would have been the, the words there. Um, and then uh, Luke is going to finish with, I'll just go back to this. Uh, Luke is going to finish with them still being in Jerusalem. Uh, to be honest, he kind of goes from this meeting with them in the room on that first day to kind of like time warped uh, 40 days later still in Jerusalem. It's interesting, Luke never mentions Galilee. So <laughs> Matthew only mentions Galilee and Luke never mentions Galilee. Um, and so it's crazy. Luke doesn't mention the Great Commission. So um, really uh, valuable to have uh, multiple people's perspectives. By the way, if you read Luke's whole gospel, um, it's all about this trip to Jerusalem. So in Luke, there's no going back and forth like there is in John. In Luke, there's like one major trip to Jerusalem. Um, and then he doesn't leave Jerusalem uh, in Luke's gospel. He's, he's there today. Uh, John 20, that's what we're going to look at today. John actually has two chapters of resurrection information. So there's going to be uh, three appearances uh, of Jesus, one to Mary, uh, one to the, uh, the, the 11, but without Thomas, so the 10, um, and then also uh, to the 11 with Thomas. By the way, uh, when Luke tells the story, there's more than just 11 in the room. So there probably were, kind of like, they only mentioned some, uh, there probably were more. Uh, Mark is the last one that I'll just kind of mention. I won't say a lot about Mark. Um, Mark tells the story of the stone uh, rolled away, uh, pretty much like you would be expecting. Mark is super weird, though, uh, in that either we lost the story at some point or it ended super weird. But there's a lot of uh, historical information that says that only the first eight verses are in all manuscripts. Um, and then the later verses only appear in some. And so like, what am I supposed to do with that? I'm not quite sure. Um, and the first eight verses don't really say much, right? So they, they mention Mary Magdalene um, and Mary of James and then Salome, so slightly different names. Um, and they, the women uh, flee uh, and they said nothing <laughs> because they were afraid. And that's how it ends, right? Um, and so, man, what a disappointing <laughs> final chapter of Mark if that was really it. So not sure what to say about that. Uh, maybe it was deliberate. Maybe it's like we wanted to say that it's an unfinished story, uh, which that does, because um, Jesus doesn't even appear to anyone, right? They just find an empty tomb. So maybe they were trying to finish it as an unfinished story, uh, or maybe it was just uh, destroyed, right? And so we didn't have the original version. Um, over the years, uh, there were more verses added, uh, but a lot of people, even early witnesses, say, you know, this wasn't in the first pass. Um, and people also comment that there's a lot of this that looks like it was written after Acts, right? And so it's hard to say, uh, but it mentions things like picking up snakes uh, and drinking deadly poison, which is weird, but that's like a story of Paul uh, on his trip to Rome, right? Which is... I don't know, it's, it, was it a prophecy or was it written later? I'm not sure. Um, at any rate, in this version, it does talk about Mary Magdalene. It's almost like a rewind, um, and it goes like back uh, to talk about Mary Magdalene. Um, and it does talk about um, two on the road to Emmaus. Uh, it says why they're in the country. Um, and they returned and reported it. Um, and then it talks about the 11, um, but it says slightly different information in Mark, right? Um, it does mention the Great Commission, 
Uh, it mentions some other things which are just kind of weird. Um, and then uh, Mark is actually one of the only ones that talks about uh, the Ascension. I think Luke might have as well. Um, and he mentions it in, um, oh yeah, maybe no Ascension Luke, uh, mentions it in Acts. So it's kind of a, a background. That got a little long. Sorry about doing that to you. Uh, but we get only certain information uh, from different gospel authors. Uh, clearly the best is that uh, that one from the road to Emmaus is a really good story. And then John, right? So the John stories are the best written. So we're going to really enjoy uh, being able to dive into John today. Um, just because I enjoy uh, thinking about things geographically, um, I, I don't know this information, but it's just kind of a way to think about it. Um, potentially, they were staying at the house uh, where they had had the Last Supper. We don't really know. Um, don't really know where in Jerusalem it is. This is the poor district, so I guess like maybe it was in the poor district, right? Um, and so the tomb, uh, Golgotha, like a tomb near Golgotha, um, would have probably been up in this area, so outside the city walls uh, in those days. Um, maybe uh, if that's uh, where they were. Oh, by the way, it could have also been that they were in Bethany, right? There could have been a house in Bethany for all we know. We don't. We don't really know. Um, if it was somewhere in Jerusalem, uh, maybe a mile. Uh, They're going to run there. Maybe a ten-minute run. Hard to say, uh, but it was mainly like through uh, through Jerusalem to uh, to get out to Golgotha. So I always enjoy trying to think about the visuals. Uh, we got a handout for you. Uh, so what I would like for you to do, uh, I don't know if you're going to actually do this or not, uh, but take a minute um, and work the handout. Uh, so it's a worksheet. Uh, so it's two pages. Uh, so there's just this uh, find the verse activity. Uh, and then there's uh, this page here, which has the text, uh, which you can use to answer the questions here. Um, and then it's also got an activity for you here to try to find a phrase uh, and see where it's repeated. Uh, and the purpose of this is to uh, help you make connections and kind of like see the literary design of John chapter 20 uh, and to help you get more out of it, right? So to kind of look at these connections. Uh, so we'll go through uh, and talk about this. Uh, maybe I'll just kind of read it with you and I'll just share some of the things uh, that we were reflecting on. Uh, so let's see, what's the best way to do this? Maybe it's just to, uh, to go full screen on this. I'm not quite sure. Uh, yeah, that'll work. Uh, so this is um, a sheet of paper that I had written on some. So I, again, I recommend you you pause me uh, and you go actually do it yourself, right? So work uh, work through all these questions. Uh, we'll talk about some of them, but mainly you should just do it on your own. Uh, but I wanted to go through and just kind of uh, talk about it with you. Um, so it starts off uh, with Mary's story. Uh, Mary's story is broken into uh, into two parts. Uh, so there's the part about the empty tomb uh, at first, and so this 1 through 10 uh, is a part, uh, and then 11 through 18 is, is kind of part 2. Uh, I'll just kind of read it with you and, and talk about some things. So early on the first day of the week, so Sunday, obviously, uh, this is the reason that Christians have church on Sunday morning, right? Before this, it was uh, Friday night and Saturday until, until twilight was the Sabbath, uh, and this switched to the way they worshipped. They started meeting on Sundays after this uh, because of this. By the way, there's a connection to this early on the first day of the week to the second story, which is like the evening of that first day of the week. So you can definitely see a, a design that John's got set up going on here. Uh, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw uh, that the stone had been removed from the entrance. If you actually did the worksheet, uh, you would have noticed that uh, there's seven different, the word saw is seven times, uh, which seven is always fun. Uh, in this uh, story of Mary Magdalene. Um, and there's actually three different Greek words. Uh, maybe I'll zoom in on it here. Uh, these three different Greek words are different levels of Saul. So there's kind of like bodily sight, uh, which is like, you know, you see a doorknob, right? Like you see it, you touch it, but you don't think about the doorknob. You don't think about its significance. You just see it. Um, the second level is to, to gaze at something, like to stare at it, uh, but to not really get it. Um, I think of like a dog, like looking at something and turning its head sideways. Um, like it's, it's something weird is going on here, but I don't, I don't really get it. Um, and then the third level is to like to see and understand like exactly what this means, right? Uh, so it's a fun activity to try to go through and guess uh, without seeing the Greek. Uh, which two are the two like most... Um, superficial uh, and then which two 
are the most like serious, right? Like which ones like I get it, right? Um, and then the other three are the in-betweens, right? Where you see it, you look at it for a while, but you don't get it. Uh, so it's just kind of fun. Uh, so we'll come back into this one. So she saw, um, and so this saw is uh, saw the tomb had been rolled away. Uh, just to share, this one is a uh, level one. Uh, so this is the most uh, superficial of, uh, you know, I see it. Uh, I don't have any idea what it means, uh, but I definitely see it. Uh, the stone had been removed. Uh, and so she came running to Simon Peter uh, and the other disciple. By the way, the other disciple, the one Jesus loved. We're going to see a lot of connections um, for this. The one Jesus loved is the one who wrote this book uh, in the next chapter. Um, the one Jesus loved is also mentioned at the Last Supper. Uh, and this also connects the, um, the other disciple to the one Jesus loved. We've, we've seen this term, the other disciple, many times. Um, and so this connection kind of suggests that perhaps whenever it says the other disciple, uh, it's referring to the one Jesus loved, which is referring to the one who wrote this book, uh, which we believe is John, son of Zebedee, right? So just kind of fun little connection there. Uh, pretty bold to describe yourself as the one Jesus loved. Uh, some people think that um, there's other editors as well, which we'll look at in the next chapter, uh, and they may have added uh, the one Jesus loved. It was a true statement, um, but perhaps it wasn't John himself who added that little tidbit. Uh, when Mary gets there, uh, she thinks that somebody's stolen him, right? So she thinks that grave robbers uh, have come. Grave robbing was a thing. Uh, so Emperor Claudius, um, so at the time, issued a decree that, that grave robbing was a capital offense, right? So like you could get crucified, right? You could get murdered for robbing a grave because it was a problem, right? Um, and if you think about it, like Nicodemus, he put in, I think it was like 100 litres, like 75 pounds worth of spices in here. And, you know, I'm sure he poured them on the body of Jesus and they evaporated some. But, like, there's money in this tomb, right? Uh, and so you've got to be very careful about uh, grave robbers. Uh, and so she thinks that somebody's come and stolen, um, either the, the Pharisees and Sadducees or grave robbers, and we don't know where he's at, right? So she was expecting to find a body, right? And she didn't, uh, which was pretty surprising to her. Uh, she comes in, in Mark, they don't tell anybody, uh, but in this, uh, she went straight to Simon Peter and the other disciples. Again, it only mentions Mary, kind of spotlights her. It only mentions Simon Peter and the other disciple, um, so it kind of like spotlights them, uh, but there were probably uh, other people. By the way, just to mention something fun, uh, this is from Mark. Uh, in Mark, um, <clears throat> whenever they ran, uh, they went to visit his disciples... Like that's group number one, uh, and Peter, uh, and that's group number two, and that's kind of weird. Some people suggest that it just says Peter wasn't with them. Uh, I think personally, Mark is largely comes from the the oral uh, giving of the gospel from Peter. I think that at this time Peter felt such remorse about his denial that he was unwilling to call himself a disciple at this time, right? So this is before Jesus had appeared to him, and so he's like the disciples, all those good people, and me, right? And so just kind of an interesting little tidbit there. Sorry, a little tangent. Um, so she goes straight to them, uh, and they start running, right? So they, they start their uh, their trek. So I don't know the trek, but maybe it was a 10-mile a run, uh, sorry, a 10-minute, uh, one mile run. Who knows what route they would have had to go. Lots of elevation changes in Jerusalem. Um and so they get to the tomb. Uh, it mentions that the other disciple outran Peter. Uh, that's one of the funnier, like, guy moments in the Gospel of John. Because it, it kind of feels like an unnecessary fact, right? Like, just kind of saying, outran the old guy, right? Uh, most traditions assume that John was quite young and Peter was probably one of the older. So from the youngest of the 12 to the oldest of the 12, maybe 15 years, right? Uh, so, yeah, he outran the old man. Uh, and so the, the young guy bent over and looked uh, and saw. Uh, so this saw, by the way, is a, another level one saw. Uh, he saw the strips of linen. Like, hey, there's strips of linen in there, right? Uh, he didn't go in. Uh, probably a young guy. It was kind of intimidating. I don't know if anybody's ever been to a graveyard today, but you don't just go barging into a mausoleum. He'd probably never been in one before, right? Uh, Simon Peter, uh, the, the senior veteran member. Uh, by the way, Simon's name is mentioned... Um, four times, um, Simon Peter, Peter, P 
Peter and Simon Peter. It's funny that the first and the last are like the full name. I only mention that because it happens with Mary too. Mary Magdalene at the start, Mary Magdalene, and two more in the middle. So I just think these works were so loved, right? Like they are so crafted. Every word uh, just, just so worked on. Uh, I just think it's neat to find little patterns like that. Thomas is going to show up four times as well, by the way. Um, and so he saw the strips of linen, but didn't go in. Um, and Simon Peter went straight in. Um, and then Simon Peter saw, uh, this is a level two saw, uh, meaning that he examined them. He's like, something funny is going on here. Uh, but he didn't get it. He, he didn't realize that Jesus had raised from the dead. He he sees it. He knows something's going on. Uh, you know, the cloth, he sees the linen, the cloth that had been wrapped around his head. And they're just lying there, right? By the way, the fact that the cloths were there is uh, extremely good evidence that it's not a not a grave robbery, right? So, um, if it was a capital offense, if you were stealing the body, you had to do it quick, right? It's so, like you're going to get in and get out uh, as fast as you can. And then Matthew uh, adds that there were guards, right? So, all, all kinds of reasons that it was not a, a grave robbery going on here. Um, and so he didn't quite get it. Uh, the other disciples, so it's kind of like there's three races. The first was the foot race, victory to John. The second one is going into the tomb, victory to Peter. Uh, and then the third race is understanding. Uh, and so this, uh, he saw and believed this is a Saul number three. Uh, he got it, right? Now it does immediately say after, he they still didn't understand from scripture that he had to rise from the dead, uh, but he at least understood the fact that Jesus uh, had raised from the dead, right? So he understood the fact, but didn't necessarily understand the whole meaning. So first human to uh, understand the fact that Jesus had risen, uh, John, right there. By the way, later it'll say that this other disciple is the one who wrote the book, the one whom Jesus loved. But you actually know it from this line here, because the only way, th this version of Saul is such a, a deep level of Saul that some people think the base word is actually from the word know, like he knew it, right? Um, but we translate it as Saul, because obviously he had to see something. Um, and the only way you could know that level of thought process going on is if you're the one writing it, right? So kind of already tells you uh, that this is the person who wrote it since he knows the innermost thoughts of this individual, right? Uh, then the disciples went back to where they were staying. So they left, right? So it might also be that um, they don't want to be called grave robbers, right? So if you get caught at an empty tomb where the body's missing, uh, you're, you're probably going to get arrested, right? So uh, they probably didn't hang out there for long. So they saw the information they needed to see, and then they left, right? So that's kind of the first first chunk of the story. Uh, then the story continues, uh, and it continues with just Mary. Um, again, in Matthew's version, uh, it has uh, two women uh, that are going to clasp the feet of Jesus. I think it was uh, Mary Magdalene uh, and then the other Mary. <laughs> I'm not sure about it. Probably Mary, mother of James, um, James and Joseph, uh, as mentioned from the cross, but um, a, a little bit uh, unsure, right? Uh, so she was outside the tomb crying. Uh, again, she she knows that, you know, <laughs> nobody we know stole the body, uh, but she still thinks somebody stole the body, right? Uh, she bent over and looked in the tomb, uh, and she saw uh, two angels. Uh, now you see two angels. Uh, you know that something's up. Uh, but she is a level two. Uh, she doesn't get it, right? And so John used this uh, kind of level two meaning of Saul. Uh, so she sees them, right? There's two angels in there. That's kind of weird. One at the head, the other at the foot, right, where the cloths had been. Um, <laughs> to her credit, um, everyone who ever sees an angel in the Bible, uh, the angel's first words are always, you know, don't be afraid, right? Because it's an intimidating thing. She's like so distraught, like she's not even concerned about the fact that she's staring at somebody who's glowing, right? Um, and, you know, they say to her, woman, uh, why are you crying? So she was crying. They said, why are you crying? Like their mindset is very different from hers. Like this is a celebration. This is the greatest thing to happen in eternity, right? And you're crying. <laughs> like it just doesn't make any sense. Um, she says, uh, repeats again, they've taken my Lord away. Same as she said of here, they've taken my Lord out of the tomb. Uh, I don't know where they've put him. Um, you know, we don't know where they've put him. By the way, there's we. <laughs> Very obvious she was not alone. Uh, but here it's an I don't know where he put him. So maybe she was alone uh, at this, although Matthew suggests that there's one other person there. Um, <clears throat> well, that made me lose my place. Um, 
at this she turned. So turned is kind of a word for like um, to like turn from your ways, right? She turned uh, and saw Jesus standing there. Now at this point, it's a level two because uh, she doesn't get it. She doesn't get that it's Jesus, right? I think everybody knows that. Um, and he says the same thing. Uh, why are you crying? Uh, then he adds a bit more. Um, who is it you're looking for? This phrase um, seems kind of foolish, childish at first, because like it's obvious who she's looking for. She's standing outside the tomb and she's uh, crying, right? Um, this is a uh, soccer ball, I guess is what we've been calling it, uh, that runs through John. So Jesus' first words in John chapter 1 uh, is, whom do you seek? Uh, if you did the worksheet, you'll kind of know this already. Uh, chapter 4, he says it again. He says uh, to his disciples, like, how's come none of you asked the woman at the well, uh, whom do you seek, right? Like, you're not trying to uh, to spread the kingdom to her, right? Like, and so this is something you should be uh, asking people, talking about. Um, chapter, fast forward quite a lot to chapter um, 19, uh, the arrest, uh, or no, wait, sorry, 18. Um, whom do you seek? Um, if you're looking for me, let these men go. Uh, and so this whom do you seek uh, has been running uh, throughout John. It's fun to, to use a tool. Um, since I'm on a computer here, I'll use Bible Web App. Uh, but it's really fun to uh, just find a word uh, and trace it all the way through. Uh, and so this word, uh, whom do you seek? Uh, oops, I'm in NIV, which doesn't have the cool tools. I'll switch over to uh, NASB. Um, whom are you seeking? Uh, and so you can see the uh, the pronunciation guide here. Um, I don't want to try to pronounce it. Uh, and you can go through and you can see every time it's used uh, in John, which is fun. So it was the first word, uh, you know, what do you seek? Um, the father seeks true worshipers. Uh, nobody asked this woman, who do you seek? Right? Like, why don't you care about this woman? Uh, and then you can just trace it all the way through. So many fun references uh, down to 18, uh, where whom do you seek? Um, and they're looking for Jesus and others. So really fun uh, to go through and do things like that. Um, <clears throat> she responds thinking he was the gardener. Uh, gardener, definitely a key word. So he was uh, arrested in a garden, buried in a garden. Uh, chapter 15 talks about how uh, I am the vine, my father is the gardener. Different word for gardener there, but still kind of the same idea. Um, and we are called to be, if you think back to Genesis 1, we're called to be, you know, authorities over God's creation, right? We're, we're supposed to be gardeners. Uh, so uh, in many ways, Jesus is a gardener, uh, but she thinks he's the gardener. It has surface level meaning of who she thought he was because it's a garden. Um, but it also has much deeper meaning, which is why John would also include things. <coughs> Third time she says it, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've got him and I will get him. Mary must have been super strong because to carry a, a full-grown man, <laughs> I think she's a little distraught there, right? Um, would, have, would have been fun. Um, they call her woman. Jesus calls her woman, which is not a derogatory title. We've seen that uh, a lot. This is actually woman number five uh, in the whole gospel, woman number six. Uh, but then the, the final one, the third in this chapter, uh, he says her name. So everything changes uh, when she's called by name, right? So it goes goes back to chapter 10. Uh, you know, my sheep know me, my listen to me voice. Uh, I call them by name. So when he calls her Mary, uh, this the whole world changes for Mary. So very, very like emotional moment, uh, which is fun. Uh, so she turns towards him. Uh, so so turns for real this time and she cries out uh, Rabboni, uh, which is, uh, you know, same as the word rabbi, but kind of a more significant rabbi. Uh, and it means teacher, a little trans, translation for people who don't know what Rabboni means. Um, and so she has named uh, Jesus. By the way, you can totally see how this is um, following the model of discipleship uh, that we've seen from like earlier chapters. Uh, it's this pattern every time of like, uh, there's an invitation, like Jesus stood there. They have mm -hmm. some experience with Jesus. Uh, and then they make a choice about who he is and they give him a name. Uh, the next steps are going to be to uh, to remain, like she tries to grasp hold of him, uh, and then to go tell others, right? And so that those things we're going to see uh, in John as well. So you can see everybody tells their stories differently, and the things that we see in John are perfectly consistent with the story we've been hearing from John all alone, right? Uh, don't hold on to me. We'll come back to that one. I have not yet ascended to the Father. Uh, go tell my brothers. And every word is interesting. Uh, I'm ascending to my father and your father, my God and your God. 
Mary Magdalene then goes to the disciples and said, I have seen uh, the Lord. So this one is the level three scene. She gets it, right? So she's uh, <laughs> number one to kind of understand who was resurrected was John. Uh, and then Mary uh, gets it. Talking about a couple of these words, just to kind of share information. Don't hold on to me is, is usually translated don't cling to me. Uh, one tool that I really like is Bible Gateway uh, because you can do this thing where you can look at it in all English translations, right? Uh, so if you look up like the word don't um, or just, just do, uh, you can see there's cling, touch, touch, cling, uh, lots of continue clinging to me. Uh, you can see the different words they use, but um, it's very similar to what um, Matthew said of clasp his feet, right? Like locked on with no plans of letting go. <laughs> it's this kind of one way to say it. Um, so works on multiple levels. Uh, works in terms of like, uh, Mary, <laughs> you gotta let go, right? Like you can't, can't just hang out here all day. Um, his reason, by the way, is that he's not yet ascended to the Father, which begs the question, um, can she hold on to him afterwards, right? So just, <laughs> I'm sure she heard the word not yet, right? Um, and, and focused on that. Um, it also works at a deeper level. You know, you can't be like united with uh, with Christ. That's not uh, not back like how Lazarus is just back. Uh, you know, my plan is to continue to do my Father's will, right? Uh, so instead, he says there's work to do. Uh, she's the first apostle. Uh, she goes to tell uh, my brothers uh, that I that I'm ascending, right? So multiple stages of uh, you know dead buried and ascending uh, ascending didn't happen at the moment of buried uh, ascending won't actually happen for another 40 days right has always referred to uh, his disciples as his disciples in the past the word changed to the word brothers just ever so subtly right so suddenly it's uh, brothers uh, and then Mary Magdalene uh, she goes uh, so we've got kind of this uh, last thing uh, to tell others so she tells the disciples I've seen the Lord by the way, I'm cheating and looking ahead here, uh, but later the uh, the disciples, uh, so the disciples told Thomas, we have seen the Lord, right? And so you get all these uh, these fun little connections. I use my scribble tool here. Uh, we have seen the Lord. Uh, I have seen the Lord. Uh, and so it's fun to just see how these things are connected. Uh, cool. Uh, my father and your father. So obviously, um, you know, the connection I have with the father is the same as uh, your father, uh, my God and your God. Uh, lots of connections over here to, you know, my Lord, and my God. Uh, amazing story uh, starts with uh, a reference to where she was from, the city of Magdala. It was a city uh, off the coast in Sea of Galilee. Um, and so Mary is from Magdala. Uh, really enjoyable. Next story. Uh, this next story is also kind of two parts. Uh, so the first part is uh, Jesus' first appearance um, on the same day. So the first day of the week, the first day of the week, uh, same, same. Just this one is uh, an evening, so just before sundown to still be the same day. Uh, so the disciples were together. doesn't say the 12 necessarily. Uh, we kind of infer the 12, um, probably the 10. Um, Luke explicitly says that there was more than just the uh, the ten here in the room at the time. So uh, who knows who all was there? Uh, but we we kind of read John and we think of ten people being in a room. Uh, the the doors were locked. Uh, definitely uh, big on that. The next appearance is going to also be uh, with the doors locked. Um, I forget what it was. Yeah, a week later uh, they were inside again. It doesn't really say the house again, uh, and the doors were locked again later. Uh, we see some weird things about uh, post-resurrection, like, new creation bodies, right? So it it's raises more questions than it answers. But you can be standing right next to Jesus and not recognize him. Mary knew what Jesus looked like, right? Like, she's been with him for years. If anybody's going to know exactly what he looks like, it's Mary, right? She doesn't recognize him. Same with the Road to Emmaus story, right? Um, and then this one. Locked doors, not a problem, right? So it's kind of hard to say uh, what that means for us. Uh, you know, what does our, um, you know, resurrected body do? Like, do we have, uh, you know, kind of like superpowers, right? Um, don't know. Uh, but, it, but it's clear that Jesus is interacting with the physical world uh, with his uh, body in a different way. He eats, um, not in this story, but in many others. Uh, he definitely eats. He still bears the, uh, the nail marks, so there's a continuity uh, all 
kinds of interesting questions. Uh, so at any rate, Jesus just shows up in the room, right? He came. Uh, so this is, again, kind of back to the, the invitation of he came. He stood among them. Uh, this is one of the questions in the worksheet. Uh, so the worksheet talks about uh, where people stand. Um, and so, for example, Judas stood with those arresting Jesus. Peter stood with those in the courtyard. The women stood at the cross. Uh, and here we see that, that Jesus stood among them, just like right in their midst. <laughs> he said a very common hello, uh, shalom, uh, would have just been what they said uh, when, when they greeted somebody. It technically means peace be with you, but really it's kind of like he could said, hey guys. <laughs> and, and so he showed them his hands and his feet, hands and his side, I don't know why I said feet, um, which is of course what Thomas is going to demand to see. Uh, they did see it, uh, and so they were overjoyed. Um, so it talks in earlier chapters about like a, a woman giving birth, um, how she's overjoyed uh, when, the, when the baby comes, right? So they're overjoyed, uh, direct connection there. Uh, a little bit too excited, perhaps, because Jesus repeats, uh, peace be with you. It's funny, it's the same word, probably shalom both times, but with two different meanings in my mind. The first is essentially hello, uh, what's up? And the second one is, calm down now. <laughs> and so uh, we're, we're going to wake up everybody and uh, going to have some visitors. Uh, we get John's Great Commission, which is much shorter than Matthew's, uh, but with the same meaning. He phrases it John style. Uh, so we've seen this in chapters 14, chapter 17. Um, he was sent by the Father, and I am sending you. And so that's uh, the Great Commission in John much shorter <laughs> and it's like John's so funny because like if you think back to the Last Supper you know you expect him to say like this is my blood which is given for you this is my body given for you much less formal uh, you expect a great commission uh, th this is it I'm sending you right uh, lots of additional dense information he breathed on them uh, in the Greek it really says he breathed into um, and we add the the on them, but that makes sense because you're breathing into something. Uh, you know, it, it means uh, breathing on them. Uh, and it says, receive the Holy Spirit. Uh, if you think about the last time in the Bible, uh, somebody breathed on somebody. Uh, so it, it makes me think immediately of, of Genesis 2, right? So God breathed into the nostrils uh, of Adam. And that was a thing, like... Uh, so the opening up of the nostrils to like breathe life uh, into somebody. Uh, Canaanites would do this with like Canaanite gods, like they would breathe life into. Uh, and so he's breathing life into people, right? Uh, he's saying receive the Holy Spirit, clear connections to what's going to happen at Pentecost here in um, 50 days, I guess 47 days. Um, <clears throat> They're going to receive power when they receive the Holy Spirit, but uh, Jesus is, is, you know, essentially breathing life into them now, right? So like 18 times. Uh, lots of commentaries talk about this uh, in great depth. I'm sure that there's a lot of uh, things that you can pull from this, uh, but uh, clearly uh, a significant moment of um, giving them, you know, his spirit now, right? So receive the Holy Spirit. Um, and then a very cryptic sentence. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Uh, that's kind of weird. Um, and so if you think to, first thing I think of is uh, a story. I think this was from Luke. I forget where. Um, but, you know, he heals somebody first. Or sorry, he forgives their sins first. And then he says, you know, who can forgive sins but God alone? Um, but so you know that I've been sent, um, you know, get up, right? Um, and so only God can forgive sins. Uh, but here Jesus is saying, if you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. Um, and so the question is, what does this mean? <laughs> you're, you're really kind of confusing. It's very much like the, uh, the blank check promise of, of whatever you ask for in my name, uh, I will do it. Um, I think the, the, one of the take home messages is, um, if your mindset uh, and the way that you think is so attuned and so aligned with uh, God's good purpose, right? If you if you understand that, um, then you know you can identify uh, when someone's sins are forgiven. Ringing off the hook over there, um, 
And so the question is, is it you doing it or is it you just identifying it? Um, hard to say. At face value, it looks like you're doing it. Um, almost no commentator uh, buys that. Um, it's more that like, you know, they know who's forgiven. Uh, it's people who trust in Jesus. And it's also their responsibility uh, to communicate with people uh, that don't trust in Jesus to say it's not forgiven, right? So like you... And, and what does it mean to be forgiven? So I always think of like um, the eternal community of love, right? Like the, that will be new creation. Uh, like who's who's in it, who's a part of it, uh, and who's not, right? And so the, the criteria is based on trusting God, right? So do you trust uh, that God has good uh, in mind for you and do you commit yourself to that? Um, and so like uh, you, can, you can help decide. So... <laughs> Um, I think I've said more than I uh, even know, but um, lots of good things to ponder there and to meditate. Uh, it's connected to many other passages uh, that you should go read, uh, you know, and Matthew and, and other places. So, all right, let's move on. So uh, first story, uh, no Thomas um, on the same day. And then eight days later, uh, we're going to do it again. By the way, NIV translates it to a week later. I think that's weird because in the Greek, it's, it clearly says eight days later. Um, but we're just like, I guess seven's close enough to eight. I don't know what to say. Uh, but uh, I just thought I mentioned that. All right. So we get Thomas, known as Didymus. Thomas uh, is a word which means twin. Uh, and then Didymus is a Greek word which means twin. So uh, on the surface, it just means he probably was a twin. So there was probably a twin brother to Thomas out there. Don't know who it was. Don't hear about him. Um, other people say it's like, oh, well, it's kind of like he's the one who shows that Jesus wasn't just like a twin of Jesus. Like it's the same person, right? Not, not quite sure. Uh, so he was one of the 12, which is now the 11. Um, and he wasn't there, right? So the question is, why wasn't he there? Um, you could assume he wasn't there because he was just out getting bread, right? That seems a little unlikely to me. Uh, Jesus, you know, picked a time where he wasn't there. and Probably he wasn't there uh, because he was unbelieving, right? He probably was um, on the run, uh, keeping his distance, uh, is, is my guess. Uh, but they, uh, they're they going after him like a lost sheep, right? Um, and so the disciples told him, we have seen the Lord, same as uh, Mary told us. Now, when Mary told them, they didn't necessarily believe either. It wasn't until they saw Jesus, his hands and his side. Uh, and so Thomas is going to be the same. And so Thomas just says, hey, here's what it's going to take. Here's my little test, which is not a good thing for us to do. Uh, I got to see the nail marks. I got to put my finger uh, where the nails were. So you see the word finger. I've got to put my hand into his side. Um, and unless I do that, uh, I will not believe, right? Uh, so this is Thomas's kind of like ultimatum uh, for what it takes for him to believe, which is crazy because if you think all the way back to chapter, what was it, 11, <coughs> when Jesus decides to go raise Lazarus, Thomas is the one who speaks up and said, you know, let us die with him, right? Kind of like, kind of like how Peter said, it's like, you know, I'll die with you. And then he denies him. This is, this is very similar uh, for, for Thomas uh, saying, let's die with him. And then um, uh, denies him, right? It's just kind of the idea. Uh, this story uh, finishes well, so eight days later, uh, and uh, they're inside again, is what it really says, um, and the doors are locked. Uh, by the way, it doesn't necessarily say we're in Jerusalem either time. Uh, the first one probably was. Honestly, eight days later, it probably wasn't, right? So they're, they're probably in a different inside house. They're probably in Galilee, right? So they're probably back in Capernaum. Doesn't say, because it's not important, so I shouldn't worry about it either. Um, and so Thomas was there this time. The doors were locked. Uh, same words. Jesus came and stood. Jesus came and stood. Jesus says, peace be with you. This is now the third peace be with you. Um, and he goes straight to Thomas uh, and repeats what he said uh, in slightly different order. Um, so put your finger here, uh, which is the second thing before. Um, see my hands. Uh, see the nail marks in his hands reach out your hand and put it in my side. Uh, I'm going to put my hand in his side. Um, and then he says, stop unbelieving. We, we say doubting. I, I would prefer we just like stop your unbelief uh, and believe. Uh, Thomas uh, doesn't necessarily do it. He, he's got all the information he needed. He thought he needed this, but it turns out that Jesus repeating his words back to him uh, and seeing him there is, is more than enough. Uh, Thomas plays the name game. 
uh, does probably arguably the best of the name game game. Uh, and he says, my Lord and my God, right? And so he has named Jesus, uh, and then he's going to uh, continue forwards. We don't see his continue forwards, but I, I feel confident that he continued forwards. Uh, then we get the, the conclusion of this chapter. Uh, because you've seen me, you have believed. Uh, blessed, this is kind of like, a, I think it's Macario, uh, very similar to the Beatitudes. Uh, blessed are those uh, who have not seen and yet have believed. By the way, uh, in John earlier it said, uh, blessed are those who do them, right? So if you uh, are doing these things, you know you're going to be blessed. And blessed are those uh, who believe uh, and have not seen. That's us, by the way. Uh, and that's, of course, contrasted with um, <coughs> John, who saw and believed. So kind of the frame uh, around chapter 19 there. Uh, cool. So that's kind of the uh, the crux of chapter 19. So we get two stories, um, one about Mary, one about Thomas, each divided into two halves. Uh, this is kind of the empty tomb half. Uh, Jesus' appearance to Mary, so one, two over there. Uh, and then over here we've got two. It's like uh, without Thomas and then with Thomas. This one I think is some of the most interesting uh, things to ponder. Uh, also in this chapter we get kind of like a book summary. Uh, so a fifth part, so breaking into five really. Uh, which we've read a bazillion times. Uh, so our, our Bob group reads this at the start of every single meeting. Uh, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples. This could be a reference to um, in his resurrected body, um, or it could mean general. Uh, so signs, we saw, uh, this is like a Bible project poster. I don't know where I've got a link to this at. Um, so we saw in this first half, uh, seven signs. Uh, so it was the, uh, number one was wedding. Uh, number two was, um, Cana, the official son. Three was, uh, the man at the pool. Uh, chapter six had two, uh, walking on water, feeding 5,000. Um, the man who had been born blind was six. Lazarus was seven. Uh, and then the only chat, the only uh, sign in this is, is Jesus' resurrection. So we've kind of seen uh, eight already. Um, so Jesus performed many other signs. So this is the revelation of who God is. Uh, John's been using this word throughout. Could be that the more things happen and they're resurrected, but probably it's just a general book summary uh, that are not recorded in this book. Uh, I should look that up. I'm guessing it says scroll or something like that. Uh, but these are written so that you can believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Uh, the Son of God, uh, that by believing you have life in his name. Cool. So um, I feel like pretty confident about that one because we've kind of been going over it a lot. Uh, so take a little bit, uh, read through it again, uh, meditate over it. i uh, got a couple activities for you to do. One is to, uh, you know, kind of go through this worksheet and look for some of the fun things. Uh, go through uh, here, see if you can find uh, these repeated words, and uh, make sure your page looks as ugly as mine does. Cool. So that's it. So John chapter 20 in the books, uh, we're ready to, uh, to keep moving forwards. Uh, as you know, we've got one chapter left. Uh, we're going to have chapter 21, uh, which is largely an epilogue. Uh, if you think about those sentences we just read, like it feels like uh, <laughs> it feels like we should have a title scene where it says the end, right? Like it feels very much the end of the book. Uh, but we've got a whole nother chapter, uh, which is great. So we're going to get another uh, resurrection story, uh, another like Jesus is going to be in Galilee, uh, which is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, and we're going to see some interesting things there about like authorship of this book uh, and other good things going on. So thanks for joining us. Look forward to seeing you next time uh, for the epilogue. See you then.